Good evening and welcome to tonight's discussion of words and music with David Mitchell and Brian Eno, chaired by Kieran Yates. I'm Molly Rosenberg, I'm director of the Royal Society of Literature and it's my pleasure to open the second Literature Matters RSL 200 event, celebrating 200 years of the Royal Society of Literature. This series uh, brings together some of the world's best known writers and thinkers for unique explorations of the impact of writing on their lives. We're very pleased this evening to be, uh, to be sharing this with our co-host, the British Library. And while we aren't able to be together at the British Library or anywhere at all for that <laughs> at the moment, uh, everyone watching can send questions for David and Brian online. You can do this at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a box that you can type into and we'll get through as many of those questions at the end of David and Brian's conversation as we possibly can. At the top of your screen, you will also see a button for the British Library's online bookshop where you can buy David and Brian's most recent books. And I have David's beautiful book just here with me. Perfect prop. Any introduction of our speakers this evening will feel partial, uh, but as a taster, Writer David Mitchell has twice been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. He has won the John Llewellyn Rees, Jeffrey Faber Memorial and South Bank Show Literature Prizes, among many others, and was named a grantor Best Young Novelist. In 2018, he won the Sunday Times Award for Literary Excellence and he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2013. Brian Eno, musician, producer, visual artist and activist, first came to prominence as a founding member of Roxy Music. His visionary production includes albums with Talking Heads, Devo, U2, Laurie Anderson and Coldplay, while his list of collaborations include recordings with David Bowie, David Byrne, Grace Jones, Carl Hyde and James Blake. His visual experiments with light and video continue to parallel his musical career with exhibitions all over the globe. Chairing their conversation this evening is Kieran Yates, a freelance journalist, broadcaster and documentary maker with a focus on current affairs, culture and politics. So I think she's the perfect person to guide us through tonight's conversation. I'll pass over to you now, Kieran. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's my absolute pleasure to be here hosting this conversation with the legendary Brian Eno and equally legendary David Mitchell. Um, and I think there's lots, you know, there's lots of interesting kind of directions to speak in, but I think a good place to start is to really feel very, for me anyway, I feel very privileged to be having a conversation about sound and music in a moment in history where the world has got quieter. I think uh, seismologists and uh, data scientists are calling this a period of, um, Anthropause. Have you heard that term? Anthropause. Yeah, um, not until now. It's a good word. <laughs> well, it basically refers to a kind of a, a global reduction in human activity. So it means that based on vibrations and the amount of noise that humans make, we're in a period of quiet. Wow. So maybe an, an obvious place to start is to see whether uh, that is reflected in your personal worlds. And if not, how are you filling your personal worlds with sound and music? Uh, I'll cede the floor to Brian first. Uh, you're the music man, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I lockdown started for me a little bit earlier than other people because I came down to my um, residence in Norfolk with the intention of tidying things up for the summer, switching the heating off and so on. And then I just stayed here and I've been here for over seven months now. And during that time, I haven't actually left <laughs> this village, really. <laughs> I, I made one journey to Norwich, which is 17 miles away, my big day out. <laughs> um, and, of course, what happened to me happened to a lot of other people, that everything in my calendar just disappeared. So suddenly I had this complete stop, and I haven't had anything like that happen for... 40 years at least, where suddenly there was nothing that I had to do. Mm. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, this must be what retirement is like. And I, th I then started thinking, have I actually retired? And I thought, well, I'll act as if I have. I'll just wait until I can't resist doing something. So I, I won't feel any pressure to, 
to do anything in particular, but I'll, if something comes up and it won't let me rest, I'll do it. And for about three months, I was quite capable of doing nothing much at all or seeing anybody or it was a strange time. But then I went back to work and actually what I noticed is that in those three months, I'd really started listening to things again. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I had found this really fantastic app, which is called Radio Garden, which I really recommend to everybody. Mm -hmm. Radio Garden is just, yes, good, write it down. Mm -hmm. Radio Garden presents you with a map of the globe, mm -hmm. and there are little tiny little green dots all over it, like stars. But each green dot is a radio station. And if, oh. you, if you hit on the dot, you are on that station live mm. with what they're playing at this instant. Mm. And I suddenly, st I started walking around this quite deserted part of Norfolk, listening to Russian Orthodox chants. There's one station that plays nothing else 24 seven. That's all they play is Orthodox chants. And there's no, no announcements or anything. You don't hear a human voice other than a singing voice. And I, for the first time for a long time, I started really, really listening to music in a, as a listener rather than as a maker. Mm. You know, there's a difference between those two things. When you're a maker, like I am when I'm in the studio, you're always thinking, what can I do with this? How can I change it? What, what can I, how can I control it in some way? But when you're a listener, you, you're surrendering, basically. You're letting something happen to you. And I kind of realized that I hadn't been doing that very much for quite a long time. I'd always been listening as a maker, as somebody who was sort of tinkering with it in my mind, thinking, what if you did that? And could you change that? What would it be like if you did this? So that was a very useful time for me, that short period. Almost exactly the same, but not with listening, but with reading. Um, I've read more since the beginning of lockdown than I think I've read in the last three or four years. Not, this, this um, sounds almost slavishly identical to Brian's words just now, but uh, not as a writer, but as a reader. Mm -hmm. uh, not as someone thinking, oh, that's clever, and how I can use that, or yeah, that's, that's great, I'll mm -hmm. have a bit of that. And, uh, just surrendering myself to uh, other writers' narratives as a reader and not just enjoying the magic tricks and not being a magician trying to analyze the magic tricks it's been great um yeah. um i've been busy uh the book came out in july it was due yeah. to be out in june um and all of a sudden my publicists and publicists and publishers were in a position of having to build this airplane as they were flying it how do you release a book how do you line everything up so all the pre-orders and all the sales happen in the one crucial week it's a bit like the opening weekend of a hollywood film to get you into the charts etc etc mm -hmm. um they were having to make it up as they went along and invent the digital the virtual book tour so i've been busy doing that and also i don't know if it's the same for brian but um with collaborations which in the case of a novelist means screen work um mm -hmm. things that are that I and friends had been idly thinking of working on together for years in some cases, but which we never could because one or both of us were always busy. All of a sudden we're actually free. We're oh. free at the same time, especially the filmmakers. Uh, yeah. They're all, well, were on furlough. And um, so I've got about, I, 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 I'm, reluctant to say how many things I'm actually working on because my agent will be watching this and I haven't <laughs> told him yet and he'll murder me if he knows the true, <laughs> uh, the true number of things I'm working on. So uh, let's quickly move on. <laughs> okay, well, David, I mean, I, I, don't want, I don't want to embarrass you too much when I say this, but I think I might do by saying that I, I actually, I, we had a conversation before this discussion and you described being a fan of Brian as like being a fan of Oxygen. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I suspect that that's not just because it's, it's a given, but it's also because, you know, the work exists around us in every day from like, you know, a Top Boy score to the starting screen of a Windows 95 startup screen. Um, how present was, has he been in the writing of the book? 
Well, I can embarrass you back because you said the same thing pretty much. Uh, <laughs> nothing really starts off a writing session as well as putting on music for airports or, 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 or indeed uh, The Ship uh, from 2016. Uh, yes, I am a fan. Um, I also said that fan's not quite the right word for Brian. It, it's, um, uh, and, and I still haven't worked it out. The kids these days uh, say a stan rather than a fan, which is a new one for me. Yeah. Have you heard that, Brian? So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. so I'm stanning you would be... Um, <laughs> uh, but, I'm not sure that a stan is a very complimentary term, is it? Um, <laughs> it comes oh, from the uh, M&M song of, about the guy who obsessed about Eminem and followed him around. You know more than me. Um, yeah. um, uh, but, you, but you were sort of you were listening to the albums while you were writing this and and Cloud Atlas, or oh, um, uh, I listen to Brian every week. Uh, I, um, I probably can't say every day, but it, it's and um, I mentioned this in a conversation I had via email with Brian uh, ten years ago. But uh, Brian, um, there's. Uh, there's there's just something in his music it's stimulating and nourishing enough to kind of drive you to the picnic area where good stuff happens <laughs> but it isn't um it it isn't hook laden it it doesn't insist it doesn't nag it doesn't say oi 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 listen to me listen to me listen to me come here come here come here uh, it's, it's 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 this beautiful uh it's a third thing uh, it's it's um it's perfect music to write to. Uh, Brian's work and 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 other composers in the area that he largely created, uh, and it's a quality that I find baroque music also has. So two types of music I can universally work to: yeah. baroque music uh, and I. I don't know if it uh, if it's a word that Brian's happy with or, or, or has become resigned to, but ambient music. Mm -hmm. uh, just it's, uh, and I'm not the only writer who who says this. I've had conversations now which would be well into the double figures when writers convene and talk about what music you work to. Your name always comes up, Brian. So, <laughs> from behalf of my tribe, thank you. Well, the, well, well, this is the thing, Brian. It's like you know, it's it's true that a lot of writers do um, kind of use you as as part of their process of making or working. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily your intention, but I suppose the the obvious question is, you know, how do you then balance that middle space between you know being just enough to sort of rouse you, but also not too overpowering that it distracts you. You know. This this whole thing started out with me wanting to make the music that I wanted to hear, which mm. is where most most of the music I do comes from. Mm. It's it's not because I go out with the intention of uh, doing something kind for other people. Really, it's because I imagine a music and it it doesn't quite exist. So sometimes um, you think, well, I could I could imagine what it would be like. It would be long and kind of fairly homogenous but ever-changing and you sort of sketch out the territory in your mind and I started out by looking for that music in the world you know the I, I remember at one point I had a cassette tape that I listened to a lot which was all of the slow movements of the late Haydn string quartets mm -hmm. so none of the athletic acrobatic stuff just the slow movements which have a, a really common quality to them they they fit together very well mm. um, and for a while that was a very satisfying way of listening to me um, but I I wanted more I didn't I didn't only want to be listening to the Haydn string quartets <laughs> so so then I started trying to imagine what how I could make this other kind of music mm. um, and, and it's partly actually because I have exactly the same issue that um, David has, which is that I want music that doesn't insist. I want music to be there, but I don't want it to be constantly grabbing my attention. Mm -hmm. I want it to be like a painting in the room. You know, if you have a painting in the room, you don't s sit there all day staring at it, do you? You look at it sometimes. You, It's there when you need it sort of thing, when you want it. And then the rest of the time you get on with what you're doing. Um, so it was 
it was sort of a surprise to me that this worked for other people as well. Um, uh, and it was a very nice surprise, actually. And the first inkling I had of that was the, the first sort of record I made of this kind was Discrete Music, which is a long, slow, instrumental piece. Mm -hmm. And that was released to catastrophic reviews, actually. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I've had one or two myself. And <laughs> <laughs> They're great, aren't they? <laughs> well, the time, I would like to say that I just, you know, shake them off like water off a yeah. back, but they're, they're yeah. quite depressing. When you're, when, yeah. Like, if you have a baby and you're out and it's in the pushchair and someone looks in and says, blimey, that's an ugly one. <laughs> <laughs> what a nose. <laughs> um, and you, you naturally feel sensitive about it. You know, it's yes. something that you're quite, if it's new for you as well, it's, you're quite vulnerable about it. Yeah. And yeah. If, if you don't feel that way, you're probably not quite doing the work you should be doing. You know, if, if you don't feel a little bit nervous about it, a little bit vulnerable about it, then you perhaps should be doing something where you are. But anyway, I, I remember one review, which I, I remember mentioning to David as well. Yeah. Um, where somebody said, and they weren't being complimentary, they said, this is music with no melody, no chords, no beat, and no lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> so that, one of the things I think you notice about when something is new, yeah. um, what people notice is what's missing from it. Mm. Uh, they don't kind of get quite what it's doing, mm -hmm. um, but they do see what it isn't doing. And so, yeah. Give it 40 years, though, and look back. They weren't trying to be a, a complimentary, but it, uh, some kind of reversal has happened, some kind of inversion has happened. Yes. And uh, it wasn't meant in a positive... Uh, it was meant, as you say, in a negative way, but uh, it, it's, it's sort of... It feels like a compliment now. Yes, so, I know. How visionary, sort of how remarkable, how... How can you do that? How could you make music? And I would I guarantee, because I'm one of the more people are listening to discrete music now than are reading the words of the gentleman or lady who wrote that review. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've kind of got the last laugh, Brian. Um, <laughs> but, but, there's, but there's a point to be made there about this relationship between you know the, the writer and, and the musician in that you are, and especially in both your work, you're taking the everyday, you know, Know, everyday language or everyday sounds and you know that might otherwise be banal and trying to create something beautiful or interesting or absorbing about them right so this is th these are the constant challenges how do you how do you take those 20 you know the letters of the alphabet and how do you make something remarkable out of them you know it's like well maybe um, a better question is no no um I, 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 I would like to have a go and then go. bounce the question back to Brian. As a writer, uh, yeah. it's uh, you, you have a, a cliche detector and the moment that goes off, you know you're doing something wrong. Uh -huh. And the moment, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, do you remember at old time village fairs, there was uh, a thing you paid 5p to do, which was to manoeuvre a loop of wire around a kind yeah. of twisted wire thing and it yeah. was an electrical circuit and if you if your hand uh wobbled and the wire loop you won't remember any of this I've read, I've read about yeah. this yeah mm -hmm. You've read about it yeah mm -hmm. uh but if your hand shook and you touched the wire with the loop thingy you were holding then it would go Meh, and you'd yeah. lost your five pence but if you got to the end um it's a that's a, a an, an, an improvised and admittedly rather ropey metaphor for writing, at least. Mm -hmm. the what, moment, what, happen, so what happens to your body when you detect a cliche, either reading um, or writing one? Uh, I may momentarily facially flinch. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you before. Yeah, like of course, of course, the record manager's a crook. Of course, he fleeces the band. Of course, the band has. Uh, of course, someone has a terminal a drug problem. Of course, they're always at one of the throats. Of course, they bicker about royalties. Of course, the drummer, as in Spinal Tap, always dies. Uh, uh, so you just 
avoid those of courses and you try to not make it go eh, and see how far you can get ideally all the way through to the end without a, uh without a cliche the etymology of cliche I just discovered the other day of course it's it's a french word but it's a french word from the printing world um early movable metal uh metal block printers in france used the word cliche for a regularly commonly occurring combination of letters oh right uh, isn't that cool uh, yeah. so um that was that's a rabbit hole mm-hmm. brian is there a um did what i just say about um um yeah that makes complete makes sense, sense to you saying yes and i i hear it in songwriting where there there are certain ways of ending a phrase which just drive me mad they actually make me feel a bit nauseous when i hear them and there's a certain like what? um well i don't actually even know how you explain this in musical terms because i don't know enough music theory but at the end of a melody that goes la da 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 you know that it's going to go <laughs> Why did you do that? Why didn't you go somewhere else? You started out so well, and then you just threw away the chance. I, I hear that so often that there's really a bit of a great idea. Yeah. And then some lazy piece of compromise at the end of it that suddenly you don't ever want to hear it again. And it is, I think that's a very good um, phrase, a cliche detector. Mm. And And I have to say, one of the things that, I like so much about David's books is that they always turn corners that you don't expect. Yes. Thank or, you. Or they, they sort of turn, cor- you kind of expect a corner to be turned, yeah. but when you turn it, there's something there that you didn't expect. <laughs> I just I just read for the third time, um, The Thousand Autumns. Oh, my word, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Oh, that's that's such a fabulous book. and. You know, when when I um, read your most recent book, Utopia Avenue, of course, there are lots of references and connections to mm. that yeah. other book. Yeah. Which I, being a bit thick, I discovered rather slowly. I started thinking. <sighs> no, no, no. It's not bad. thick. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, I like the idea that uh, some people won't read one or the other. I like the idea that some people will only make the connections very slowly. I like the idea that more hardcore readers who keep the kind of charts of hyperlinks and cross references that I don't actually do it. Uh, uh, I like the idea that they'll notice instantly. So, 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 so there's no one right way to read a book. That does make me wonder if you refer to work musically from 20 years ago or 10 years ago, are there, echoes and resonances not only within uh, a composition but between your compositions yes i i think so i mean i've actually been doing something odd the last few days i've just got a new kind of sampler um a sampler is a way of taking a recording and using it as an instrument so you, once you've taken the recording that becomes the material that you can play on a keyboard you know all those things you hear people doing but this one is is kind of an interestingly different one and i've been taking a lot of my old work well i have a huge archive of stuff that i've never released either because i just didn't finish it or it didn't sound very good at the time or whatever Um, i have about six thousand pieces like that whoa (laughs) i was gonna i was gonna say i I remember you doing an interview in, in 2014 where you said you had like 2,800 unreleased, unreleased pieces. So that's just Gone accumulated well, since then. What I've been doing with this sampler is putting pieces in and seeing whether I can make turn them into something new and more interesting. And, and uh, in doing that, I've sort of started noticing that I have certain habits that I wasn't aware of, compositional habits. Um, and they're very much to do with the cliche detector. They're very much to do with me thinking, now, what would be an interesting surprise here? What mm. wouldn't you expect to happen in this landscape? Um, what, but on, at the same time, you don't want random surprises. Obviously, it, isn't, it shouldn't be just anything. If you, want, <laughs> if you want pure random, then 
it's kind of meaningless. So there has to be some sort of setting up of expectations in the composition, and then some twist, some, you either disappoint those expectations or replace them with something else or exceed them. But um, this, this is the kind of limit of randomness because a lot of people think, oh, random will be great because you know just anything could happen, so it's bound to be interesting. But it isn't actually, we, we aren't interested in just anything. We're interested in things that connect in, in unexpected ways. But they do have to connect, I think. This is John Cage territory he seems yeah. to be talking about here. He he really pushed the lyric, uh, pushed the limits of um, he. There's a word for random that's escaped me. It's al aleatoric. Aleatoric, yeah. Aleatoric. Thank you. Uh, the true wordsmith of the Zoom session here. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it does seem to be true that. Um, it, 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 just at a sort of Spotify level, um, his compo his um, written the compositions like in a landscape would be much more listened to and loved than the completely aleatoric, yeah, the compositions. Well, with Cage, it was Cage is kind of interesting because he was so sort of evangelical about his approach to music. It was it was a practice for him. It was part of being a Zen Buddhist and. The, what mattered to him was the practice rather than the result. And that inspired me a lot when I was a young musician or a young composer. Yeah. And, but over time, I started to realize it was quite a limiting philosophy because it sort of said, stop behaving as a composer. Let, just let the thing happen. Let the thing turn out as it will. The universe will arrange it for you. And, and I realize that this is a kind of a connection to a political philosophy that has got us into a lot of fucking trouble. Mm. Actually, sorry, sorry about swearing. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've come up with this new word called, called inevitabilism. And I think the philosophy that has dominated the last 40 or 50 years is really this idea that somehow human evolution is in certain ways inevitable. For instance, the, a good example is that Francis Fukuyama book. Um, uh, the End of History. Yeah, which is sort of this idea that all societies will eventually turn into capitalist democracies because that is the natural order of things. And of course, mm. you know, See, look what happened. <laughs> I don't um, think right. President Xi has read that book. <laughs> um, can I just take, take you back to just that point about form and dismantling form? Because I, I think it's so interesting for both of you. Just, you know, I know that, I know that you talk about, uh, well, I think you were talking about multi-track technologies when you said this, Brian, but I think it, it applies here. When you're talking about knowing, learning how to know how to fuck something up. So, you know, you, you learn the forms and then you kind of are able to go back in and, you know, both of you are doing that. Maybe, maybe Brian's doing it via a reverb or Logic Pro. Maybe David is doing it through your structure. But, you know, how do you think that that thinking has evolved now, you know, as, you, as we find ourselves in a sort of political and social moment where not everybody has had, you know, the benefit of great arts educations that have taught them these forms to learn to dismantle them? Do you think that... We need a heady mix of both that we can, you know, we, we've learned the forms and dismantle them, or can we just go and kind of do that, that sort of, here's a chord, here's another, now make a band. David, what do you think? If I ever was sort of surfing on the zeitgeist uh, of popular culture uh, slash intellectual culture, it's been a long time since I fell off the surfboard. Uh, <laughs> and... and Washed up in the wilds of West Cork. So I can only really speak for novels. I can only really speak for my home form, mm -hmm. uh, which is the novel. And yeah. I would say that um, there's a huge generalisation here, I guess, but uh, it's that kind of conversation, so why not? Um, I think the phrase experimental novel was a deathly thing that maybe justly... Uh, led with 
the postmodernism down a rather sterile cul-de-sac. Nonetheless, uh, its ghost kind of has reincarnated in the 21st century in the novel in the form of a kind of meta-awareness of the of what a novel is made of uh plot character style um themes or ideas and fifth structure uh and i think an understanding that structure is a relatively it, it's relatively sort of un um unexplored or or, or, or little mind uh, mm. in the 300 year history of the form. Uh, the other things are mm. s- style moves at the speed of the evolution of language. Um, characters move at the speed of change in the world. Uh, Jane Austen couldn't have written a data analyst or a sampler inventor, but we can now, but you can't really go faster than that unless you move into science fiction. Uh, plot, uh, plot again. Um, it's the world, or it's what a dreamer dreams, or anything in between. Uh, there's something fixed about that. However, structure. Um, I think there's a there's an understanding that. Well, maybe I'm simply talking about myself, and to try to impose this on other novelists isn't completely authentic but I feel uh, and I do spot that I'm not the only one that uh, there are you have a reasonable shout at doing something pretty brand new in structure Mm -hmm. something that hasn't been done before with the other components of the novel good luck I mean you you might maybe you can especially if you're say uh, J.G. Ballard or uh, um, William Gibson uh, kind of zeitgeist surfer I suppose we could say that uh however that's really not how I'm kind of made uh and and it's hard to find something sort of pretty awesomely original um that takes you beyond the compass of merely where your cliche director will uh detective will shine a light on Mm. however in structure maybe you can in structure you possibly can think down I know because I've done it once or twice and thought of a new structure for a novel and you think actually has, has, has anyone written a novel with that structure before and you're trying to think of it actually maybe not I wonder I wonder why is it because it really won't work or, or is it because maybe no one's thought of it before so that's what I have to say about structure uh, I've also, been talking that's, a, that's a really good point that that genres move at the speed of language because then of course someone would you know might attach your work with the language that they use like magical realism or something and you might read that and think well actually that doesn't quite that doesn't quite describe what I was doing which is which is why sorry I'm just, just gonna say which is why I also really like how Genesis cited uh, Brian Eno's work as enosification <laughs> on their credit. Enosification, what a great you know, word. The, the language hadn't quite developed yet to sort of adequately describe what that was. And I think that you're absolutely right. And it's it's, a, it's an interesting thought. Uh, I'd like to bounce this to Brian. I mean, I think innovation, certainly in the novel, it actually comes from outside the novel. It comes from, say, film. It comes yeah, from yeah. right now. Na- yeah. Right now it's coming from... Well, it's coming from Netflix. It's Mm. coming from the streamed show. It's coming from long form, small screen drama, which um, I think of a show like, um, I've I've been hooked on it over lockdown. So it's at the the forefront of my my mind, Better Call Saul, which is, uh, which is kind of the full flash before Breaking Bad. Uh, And, and, I love how it plays with time. Uh, mm. Traditionally, at a sort of creative writing class level, you only resort to a backflash when you've got no other way, when there's nothing else to do. Half of Breaking, well, a third of Breaking Bad is in the form of a backflash. There's a strand of backflash which you think is a backflash, but then you realise it's, it's actually in the future. It's after the show ends. It's mm. uh, and the whole. Sorry, sorry. So, are you, are you saying that in creative writing, you might have been taught that a flashback was an amateur device? Yes, okay. yes, I am. Okay. Uh, and here's Breaking Bad saying, "Oh no, it isn't. This is absolute. This is 
beautiful stuff. Uh, mm. How about the backflash, which you don't even declare as a backflash? Uh, mm. uh, I see that. I think. Kind of, um, well. Uh, since I'm the um, only person who hasn't used the F word yet, I think that's fucking amazing. <laughs> I want to do that. Uh, so, um, so I think um, uh, clearly my home form, the novel, does evolve. That's why we still don't write like Smollett or any of the 18th century crew. Mm. Why does it evolve? Because the world changes and um, other art forms um, make inroads or yep. not inroads, but, uh, but they feed my home form stuff which is now where i'd like to bring brian in and see if this is applicable to music well um yes absolutely the what what is obviously happening in novels is has a lot to do with editing in films as well where suddenly you're you're moving between places and times very very quickly and um i've noticed that the speed of that happening has gone up in tandem with the speed yeah. happens in films actually yeah we're, we're quite used now to the idea of being back in time forward in time at another place in someone's mind mm. in someone's sort of counterfactual other reality mm. in reality um but in in music i think one thing that really drives musical evolution is the fact that we are all incredibly literate musically if you think of how much music we all hear all of the time, I mean, I don't think in the history of humankind has there been this level of saturation of one art form in a culture. Just think of, you know, radio, for instance. We've all got radios. We've all got phones that carry music. Um, I would say that most people probably listen in some semi-conscious or conscious way to music I don't know, maybe four hours a day at least, and some people a lot more than that. Um, mm. So when we're listening to things, what we're doing, I think, is constantly making comparisons. We're, we're saying, oh, I like this because it's different in a particular way from everything that I've ever heard before. So we never listen to any, or we never read anything with, with a clear, untroubled mind. We, we're always looking and listening to things. Um, with the whole history of our listening and looking at the back of it, you know. So it's like, I always think the newest thing you hear is like the punchline to a, to a very long shaggy dog story. You know, it's just the, it's the latest sentence in this long conversation you've been having. And um, in music, a lot of that conversation is actually to do with something that I think art does for us, which is, which I put into this little proverb I have, which is that science discovers, but art digests. So science is constantly producing new material about the world, new ways of understanding it, new ways of dealing with it and controlling it and so on. What it doesn't produce is any sense of the value of all of those things. It just tells you that they're there, but it doesn't tell you what it does to you or what you can do with it or what you should do with it or what is worth doing with it. And I think what happens with art is that people take all of that stuff and start making things with it. And they're sort of saying, this is what you can do with this. This is how you can feel about this. Mm -hmm. This could be exciting. We don't like this part. Um, if you think of the relationship between technology and music in particular, um, I can tell you that there's an exponential increase in the number of options that a composer now has. It doubles about every week, as far as I can see. You know, I get emails every single day from manufacturers saying, we've got this new product that can wow. do this. And, and a lot of it is repetitive, but a lot of it isn't as well. There, there are genuinely new inventions being made all the time in, in software. And, of course, the question is, what do you do with it? What can you do with all of this? And what can you now do that you could never do before? That's sort of an interesting question. And what is the value of any of it? So if you listen to, well, I won't go too far into this rabbit hole because I could talk about this for a long time. But if you listen to um, what has happened to the actual texture of music in the last 15 years, where you have the one extreme ex 
really extreme gloss of the big production R&B ballads, which are incredibly carefully crafted and made with such extraordinary attention. You know, there are people who just specialize in getting a kick drum sound. Wow. That's their job. They come wow. up with kick drum sounds and they spend hours and hours working with tech that will produce this kick drum sound that cuts through. But on the other hand, you then have people who make records like Stormzy, for example, with what seems like just a rough piece of found music, not even found on a record, but found on a cassette or something like, or off the radio. And this span of, here's the techiest, the Star Trek of music, and here's the uh, graffiti artist of music sort of thing is I think is very a very interesting comment about what music is saying we we are allowed to do now and we we're allowed to include can I just quickly just, just well, two more things I just want to explore one thing that I, I think is very interesting that you said there is about a kind of a musical digital archive um, and one of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading uh, Utopia Avenue actually was about the British Library's Extraordinary Sound Archive, which if you haven't visited, you absolutely should. Um, which of course is beautiful because it takes you, you know, it, it, it sort of, you can hear, and I'm, I'm talking outside of just song selection, you can hear what Brixton High Road sounded like in 1971. Mm. And so you sort of, you get this textural city sounds of, of traffic and chaos and, and all of that stuff surrounding it and it's you know it's it's things that both of you use in your work you know Brian obviously through sampling and, and reverb and and David through the pages mm -hmm. so when you are exploring archive outside of the easy things to get like songs where are you sourcing that from and and what part of the archive are you searching um, let's start with David yeah uh, I didn't use that archive for Utopia Avenue. Um, I guess my archives are uh, the minds of Brian's contemporaries and just slightly older contemporaries who were there in the 60s, who uh, luckily for me over the last 10, 15 years have produced quite a steady stream of books, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, some are excellent, some, some aren't, but even the aunts are, they will have little, killer details um like what um i thought you'd say that um <laughs> like like um bed sits where you went uh where you hired a room and uh there was a the legs of the bed were in sources of vinegar to stop things climbing up the beds legs and biting you for example or um landladies who would fix the meters so that you got less bang for your buck you got less um right. uh, you got less <laughs> you're nodding as if you may have encountered one or two of these uh landladies yourself right uh I, I, um since brian introduced uh neologism earlier uh inevitabilism uh uh, I, um, I would like to introduce the IWATH, I W A T H, which is an acronym of "I was there," and it's a it's a, a kind of a fact or 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 or, a, or an insight or just an experience which you can't get from Wikipedia. Uh, you could only know it if you're an insider. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, uh, just before the show uh, or, or before we started, Brian was talking about. Um, uh, the difference between venues where there's a long echo and venues where there's a short echo. And when you play in a venue where there's a long echo and you play a duff note, it hangs for a long time, as opposed to a smaller container. Now that is an eyewath. Uh, yeah. Unless you're a musician who's performed in these venues, you wouldn't know that. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I research, I, I, I harv uh, so a part of my job is to harvest eyewaths and you put about three in a scene, three eyewaths in a scene and it will smack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. One or two, you feel a little bit like a novelist who's winging it and hasn't actually been there. Five, six or seven, then you feel like a novelist who's showing how much research he or she has done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> three is the, the Goldilocks just right number. Uh, <laughs> 
the Goldilocks, the Iwas Goldilocks. The Iwas Goldilocks three, yeah. Um, That's excellent, thank you. Um, just one one last question before we open up to public questions. Um, is you know, it's sort of re- is it's sort of related to what you're talking about about this relationship with technology, but you know, in the very specific worlds of you as as artists, and I suppose. You know, a very simple outside of you might be that some of the challenges that you face are that, you know, there's no, for David, there's no sonic component to the page. For Brian, there's no sort of um, visual component to the speaker. So what are the things that you'd like to see in technology that would limit these kinds of challenges that you have? It's interesting. Uh, You say there's no sonic component to a page, uh, nor visual component to music. You're right, and yet, yeah. uh, Brian's last, uh, uh, or, or one of his more recent um, albums, Mixing Colours, is 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 sort of about this. Uh, yeah. We were talking about synesthesia uh, when we had our um, email exchange some 10 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, Brian, and uh, you said you weren't synesthetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and which, is, yet, which is when you experience music in a sort of visual, um, you can taste it and, and see it. And it's when colors, two right? senses um, hack into each other and yeah. you can see tastes or you can see um, a colour and taste strawberries or you can um, or you see a word and you can smell fish. But the word won't be fish, and the colour won't be red. It, it, it's 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 a sort of neurosensory yes. overlap. Hack. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think a part of the challenge. Well, um, clearly with Utopia Avenue, I'm trying to do the famous aphorism that's variously attributed, often to Frank Zappa, writing about music is like dancing around architecture. Uh, and on the one hand, you can't, but then Ingenuity is also about escapology. It's about devious straitjackets that make it impossible to do something in the form. And yet somehow finding some way of slipping that straitjacket off Mm -hmm. and finding some way to make text on a page somehow musical. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to bounce this to Brian. Um, You say you're not synesthetic, yet you have 18 compositions all named after a colour. And... I was listening to the Rose Quartz one, and there is something pink about it. Uh, <laughs> how come? Uh, 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 over but to I you. Think, I think I think you know the answer to this because you've you've written about it actually, where you said um, if you put two things together, a, a piece of music and a word, in this case, your brain will do a lot of work to to make the connection between them, and. I, I always think that that's very interesting to sort of hand some of the compositional work over to the brain. Of course, that's what any artist who's any good is doing. He's, he's sort of putting in place some elements which are somehow provocative and react with each other. Mm. And I, I use the word, they have high valency, so they, they can connect with things. And valency. Then, valency, yes. Like that's in Twitter, when things have va- different valencies. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think that it's particularly with, um, well, with both of our works, actually, it's partly to do with knowing that the listener's or the reader's mind is wanting to make interesting connections mm. um, and that they only need the material for that. And they've got all the apparatus for that to happen. There's, there's a whole machinery up there, which is actually quite active. It's not at all passive. Um, I mean, both both of our works, I think, depend on a fairly active, actively engaged um, reader or listener, um, active in the sense of not wanting to be led by the hand through every single um, part of the adventure. You know, being being sort of left slightly stranded in a way, and enjoying the feeling of finding out where you are and looking around and thinking, oh, it could be this, or it could be that. I mean, I see, I see this a lot in your work where there are, there are often sort of false leads or 
connections that you think, oh yes, that that's probably connected to that. And then it turns out it's not actually, it's connected to that one over there, you know. Um, so there's a sort of um, adventure going on in the reading of the thing, as well as it contained in the um, work itself. And I, I have to say that um, the part of the reason for the cliche detector is to make those adventures interesting, mm -hmm. um, to, to not have them go down familiar paths, because actually nobody wants to read that. Uh, yeah. Or, or yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop you there so we can... So we can... I, 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 I super rudely have to say, uh, Brian's famous for his collaborations as well as his solo work. Uh, and from, from what he's just said, I'm thinking now that his ultimate the collaborator is actually always his listener <laughs> that's a good point that's a nice thought yeah um, you, I, was, uh, I guess i was also thinking about like in, in terms i was also thinking i guess in, in terms of logistical technology you know uh, i was thinking about two pieces which you might be interested in one was uh, a book uh texture of paper where when you put your human finger on the on the song title that's written on the text it plays the music through the page uh, and another is a piece of AR technology, uh, which is sort of trying to take this synesthetic relationship with music and replicate it as you put your your AR goggles on. And I mm. thought perhaps perhaps that's where things are going next. Yeah. Anyway, some uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to quickly. I think we've got time for a, a couple. Um, this is too short, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And if um, you're up for a series of these, Brian, then you know where to find me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, a, I, I feel like there's a long email thread coming from both of you. Um, you've spoken about the relationship of time to your forms, but do you both write with time in mind? Uh, David, do you always know an idea is going to be an extended fiction, a longer novel? And Brian, do you always think in terms of an album or a track? Um, the answer from my side is... Sometimes, I sometimes know that uh, something I put into one book will be erupting uh, into the next one. Other times I don't, uh, I don't even know there will be an eruption until I get there. Um, I'd also just like to make the point that uh, the way that singulars and pronouns work in our language encourages to think of many things as singular when they're actually plural. Mm. Time is one of them. Uh, surely it would be much more accurate to be talking about times yeah. routinely. We have lifetime, we have daytime, we have geological time, we have calendrical time, we have, uh, we have astronomical time, we have dream time, we have so many times mm. uh, that um, I, I can't quite say how this comes into my work, but I think of time as a plural thing. Yeah. And... Um, without being able to say exactly why I think this seeps into novel time. Mm -hmm. Over to Brian. Yes, so um, I suppose what, what happens with me is that I start things rarely with a, with a clear picture of how they're going to end up. And um, some of them just keep wanting to be longer. Um, some of them, I just want them to last a long time because I want to be in that place for a long time. Mm. As other things don't sustain like that. Other things pay off quite quickly mm. and they sort of show you what they are and then you've had enough of them. Um, in fact, sometimes I quite often find I'm cutting things back because I don't want to over, over egg the pudding, if you like. But certain things, I, I was working on a piece the other day that started out being about two and a half minutes long. And by the end of the day was nearly 22 minutes long um, because I was sitting in the sun outside my studio, listening to it. And it was just a lovely experience, <laughs> but it kept stopping and I had to keep getting up and <laughs> it. Again. So, so, so how do you know when something is finished or do you? Uh, when I hit the deadline. <laughs> That's, that's actually how I finish most things. Okay. Um, you know, all that stuff I have in my archive is, is sort of waiting for a deadline. Um, right. And so when something comes up, you know, for instance, a film soundtrack, for example, 
I nearly always start by going to my archive and thinking, oh yes, this piece, that could be, that could be the piece that will work here. And then I finish it. So in a way, I don't really care to finish things until I know where they, what their job in the world is going to be. Is it a film soundtrack or is it something that I put on and sit and sit in the sun and listen to? So, so I have lots and lots of beginnings, basically. Yes. Have you uh, done any, have, um, I, love, you... I love the idea of um, a deadline as an editor. That's great. <laughs> uh, that's, that's kind of true for me, too. Um, I know when something is finished, when I do an edit uh, and I change it back to how it was before the last edit. Uh-huh. That's <laughs> when I know to stop fiddling. Um, have you done any video game work, Brian? Because yeah. some of the music on that is, is, is art. Yes, yes, that, that's, that's a very interesting area. I did a game years ago called Spore, which was um, by... Oh, I know it. Yeah, I've got that. Okay, yeah. good, yeah. yeah. So Spore, I think, is the first generative video game music. It, you know, it, what used to happen before Spore was that you just stored a lot of loops, basically, in the computer... And then when you went to that scene, that loop would play. And you went to another scene, that loop would play. But um, what um, I did with my friend Peter Chilvers was we, we made a, a little engine that had sets of rules. So when you're in this part of the game, you have this set of rules to make music by it, and then this other set. So each time you go to a scene, um, you actually hear new music in that scene. It's not it's not going to be identical to the last time you were there, yeah. but it will be of the same general feeling, you know? Um, so I think now that's how a lot of video games are done, but that's the only one I've done. One question from um, Wendy in the audience. Uh, she says, uh, as you talk of cliche detectors, I turn over today's card from my oblique strategies deck. <laughs> Oh, I'm, also <laughs> I'm also a fan uh, which says use an old idea which points towards the need to not always discard the often used in favour of the always new a cliche used well can startle and convince yeah. thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. she's yeah. completely right so I, I think that there are many different kinds of innovation mm. one of them is the obvious one of doing something that nobody has ever done before another is the less obvious one of leaving something out that nobody has ever left out before. Mm. Um, But another one is doing something again that somebody hasn't done for a long time. Um, Something that has sort of suddenly gained a new charge because it's once again unfamiliar. Um, You you hear this all the time in music where, you know, some, somebody suddenly puts a Dixieland jazz band in a, in a funk song or something like that. Yeah. It's fresh again, you know, it's, it's suddenly in this new context, you hear it anew. Um, so, so yes, that, that use an old idea is really saying, don't think that originality only consists in doing things that haven't happened before. I would also agree that originality can sometimes lurk uh, at the opposite end of the galaxy from the cliche, but sometimes it can be hiding inside the cliche. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you could take a familiar phrase, of course, I won't be able to think of a single example now, I have to, but you take a familiar phrase you've heard a hundred times, 500 times, and change one word, and yeah. suddenly it just sparkles with wit. Um, headline writers do this really well, oddly enough. That's that's a part of their job, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to put too fine a pint on it. And and maybe a, a, a final question, which is kind of a beautiful one, and one I'm sure you're asked all the time, but what were the first pieces of music that you heard that made you realise the, fear, the sheer visceral power of the art form that you fell in love with? Well, why don't you answer that first? Um, I will, because the musician should have the last word on this one, uh, particularly. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do. Uh, I remember it really clearly. My And I remember the radio. Uh, it, was, it was a transistor radio that my mum had when she was a student that I had when I was a small boy. I kind of inherited it. Uh, just a mono. It was a hacker 
uh, was the name of the radio. And I remember the time, the place, it was the back bedroom in the house I grew up in in Worcestershire. There was a view of the fields and the Malvern Hills and the sun was going down, beautiful, heartbreaking sky. And uh, I must have been about nine or ten and I twisted the dial and it was that time of day when on those old radios you'd for, for atmospheric reasons you'd get signals from the other side of the planet just bouncing off the cooling air and this utterly enchanting song just arrived uh and i'd never heard anything like it I, and i didn't know music could do that yeah um and it took me some months or years i i i, I had a cassette recorder one of the box types that you had to play cassette uh, you had to play record and play at the same time and I put the radio yeah. uh, on it next to the mic about a third of the way through the song uh, because it took me that long to find a cassette and, we, and it was so beautiful and some months or some years later I learned the name of the song was Across the Universe by oh, the Beatles that was it that's a lovely song too oh, isn't it what's yours Brian well, I don't have such a clear sort of creation story as that one. That's a very good one. I, I can remember the first thing I can remember really being sort of baffled and intrigued by was um, that silhouette song called Get a Job, which was a doo-wop song from the late 50s. I well, think it actually came out in 1957 or something like that. Mm. It's, and it's got... Um, you know how, how do up sounds. There's a bass voice. It's it's all voices. That there is some instruments in there. But <laughs> I thought, what is this? Where does this come from? It sounded really to me like something from another civilization, actually, mm. another another universe. Really, speaking of across the universe, and I can remember thinking, wow, music can be anything, really. You know, and, and I was so fascinated by this. And then I started buying doo-wop records um, because we, I grew up near some big American air bases. So there were PX stores that you could go and buy records there. Wow. And of course, they, there was a lot of Southern R&B and stuff that you just never heard on the English radio. Mm -hmm. And I built up quite a big collection of, uh, from uh, very young actually, of um, sort of doo-wop songs. And the other thing <laughs> that I collected was Ray Conniff singers. I don't know if you know who Ray Conniff is. I'm afraid not. It was, he was the sort of 1950s version of the James Last Orchestra. <laughs> okay. <I'm> <laughs> had a real sound to it. They had this yeah. making, mixing strings and voices. In these lovely soft melodies and, and it sounded like silk yeah. um, and again it was it was where does this come from you know I was just fascinated by what world these things came from and it took me a long time to realize that all the doo-wop stuff that I liked was actually black people I didn't know that because I didn't have any photographs of them I just yeah. had these records and the records had names on them but no idea who they were and it, I was about 14 before I realized that nearly everything in my record collection, except the Ray Conniff singers, was black music. Wow. It was a real surprise. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you. I, that's, that's that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Kieran. That thank was you. really beautiful. Thank and lovely to speak yeah. to you. Oh, lovely to speak to you both. Thank you for being here. I'm going to... Uh, pass it back over to Molly but it was my absolute pleasure and I'm sure this was this is the part where there would be a rousing applause in a live audience which hey, Joe, we'll do it yeah hey. which, <laughs> which you absolutely deserve so thank you so much thank you too Kieran and uh, thanks to everyone at the British Library and the Royal Society of Literature for making this happen <laughs> yeah thank you too Brian good luck for the future yeah <laughs> I think we'll need it <laughs> yeah right I'll say. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, Brian and Kieran. Ingenuity may be about escapology, as David said, but I think all of us listening and watching to you felt that we got ingenuity from being locked into your conversation. So thank you all so much for that. Um, if you want to come to more events like these for free, 
I mean, who am I kidding? What event is like this? But we can try. Um, please join the Royal Society of Literature. Membership starts at £40 and gives you free access to all the RSL's events, publications and book groups, which we're doing all online at the moment. Members will also have special access to the RSL's uh, birthday announcements, 200th birthday announcements uh, at the end of November. Uh, so please, if you can join our mailing list, join our membership through rsliterature.org, then you'll get uh, special access to all of those. The RSL's next event is on Wednesday next week. Uh, please join us for a conversation between writers and psychoanalysts about the relationship between writing and isolation with Lisa Opinionese, Ortega Uagba, Josh Cohen and Louise Doughty. Then at the end of October, uh, celebrate Zora Neale Hurston's enduring influence at our event in partnership with the British Library again and the Black Girls Book Club. We'll have a book group, which you can sign up for on the RSL's website, which is going to be co-hosted by me and the Black Girls Book Club founders, Natalie Carter and Melissa Cummings Quarry. That will be followed the next day by a conversation between Scott Macker, Jackie Kay, and poet Selena Godden on Hurston, the Harlem Renaissance, and what both say to readers now. If you want to tell us how much you've enjoyed this evening, which I am certain you all have, maybe not as much as I have, but probably just as much as I have, uh, we'd be very happy to hear that from you. So you can see at the top of your screen, there's a button to give us feedback, or you can let the RSL and British Library know on whatever social media takes your fancy. Uh, a reminder that you can buy David and Brian's latest books through the link uh, that you can see just above this as well. Please go and buy them now. You must support these fantastic artists. They have given you so much this evening. Um, <laughs> A big thank you to everyone at the British Library, my colleagues at the RSL and our producers, Unique Media, for making tonight possible, and to all of you for joining us this evening. Until next time, a huge thank you, and I will do an applause, even on my own, to our speakers to thank them for, for what they've given us tonight, and a good night to all of you. Thank you.